Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming to our presentation on the past and present artists of Jacksonport. My name is Dawn Honnold. I am currently the president of the Jacksonport Historical Society. I want to thank all the members of the committee who have put this together. They have done a great job, and we're going to have a, a great presentation this evening. Um, I also want to thank Laddie Chapman, who is doing the recording of this program. And you will be able to see this, he says, by 7 p.m. Sunday evening on the 25th. It will be on channel 986 on Charter. There's also a video that you can see on YouTube. Um, there is an address for that. It's www.doorbell.net slash video. But he also has cards up front. If you want all the pertinent information, take one of his cards and then you'll have it with you at all times. Um, and also, if you are interested, there will be DVDs available in the, in, you know, after this program is done, and Laddie can prepare those, and you can have those for purchase. Um, but that's up to you. But like I said, if you're interested, take one of his cards, and then you have all his information. Also tonight, I am going to introduce Marilyn Hine. She is going to be the moderator for this evening. And she, Marilyn... <laughs> And Marilyn grew up in Door County. Her great-grandparents on both sides of the family, the Hines and the Erskins, were settlers in the late 1800s. And no matter where she lives, this is home. When her youngest of seven children began kindergarten, Marilyn began college. She earned her bachelor's degree in psychology from Lawrence University when she was 50. When her youngest began college, she moved to Seattle, Washington to attend graduate school. She earned her master's degree in counseling at age 60. Marilyn has a part-time private practice, Hearts Unfolding Counseling in Oshkosh. She is fulfilling a dream by producing a line of encouragement cards. Cards over there. She loves being grandma and to 19 grandchildren. Also tonight, in addition to the artists presenting their items tonight. We do have books for sale that uh, the Historical Society has printed in the past. They are for sale. There's other cards and other um, pictures and things that are for sale. So if you have any interest after the program is done, take a look and see what we have to offer. Now, I am presenting Marilyn Hine. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming, and I assure you, you are going to enjoy it because Jacksonport has been home to so many inspired, creative people. So now you'll enjoy them or the work that they've done. So the artists from the past that we will be showing, because we, we couldn't possibly have all of the wonderful artists from Door County. So this is the beginning of our productions. Um, Fred Erskine was the oldest. He lived to be 97. Aileen Scutt. <laughs> Aileen Scutt was 68. Noreen Golden, 93. And Kathleen Kit Butler Coolius was 51. Joseph Cook, 72. Joanne Scory Minier, 82. Pat um, Ann Rosier Rondeau, 84. And Jean Dorn Wilden, 84. So longevity here in the Jacksonport area. The first one we're talking about is my grandfather, Fred Erskine. Grandpa was born in the Jacksonport Post Office, which I still miss. Um, and he lived in Jacksonport all of his 97 years. In 1910, Grandpa built a camera from parts he ordered from Sears and Roebuck. His love of photography led him to become Jacksonport's photographer, always creative and inventive. He found a way to be in family photos by attaching a string to the toggle on the camera. He would 
set the camera and hurry to get in the picture and then pull the string. And he also developed his photos in a little dark room that he had built in his home. And I remember going in that little dark room with him with the red light and watching him as he swished everything through the chemicals. During the years he was in World War I, he took many photos, which he developed in his tent um, to preserve, oops, where am I looking here? Um, to preserve these historical photos, I wrote a book, Fred Erskine, World War I Veteran, and it's here for sale. The Jacksonport Historical Society honor, honored Fred by highlighting many of his Door County photos in the book, Jess, Jacksonport's Photographer, which is also here for sale. After Grandpa retired, he built a house back in the woods on County V. Catherine LeClaire um, owned and purchased the former post office property in the 70s. She was an early environmentalist and wanted to preserve the root cellar, which I so enjoyed that I'm so glad it was preserved as a kid. That's where I ran up and down and up and down and wore out my clothing and where I would go in with grandma and she'd say, well, let's be careful. There might be a skunk in there. We have to check first. Um, so Catherine DeClara donated the lot to the town of Jacksonport and it's now the Erskine Rest Area. Um, I'm going to show a few of grandpa's paintings. My next book will be um, an Erskine book with a lot of the information that I share when I lead a hike at Erskine Woods. So you can see the stacked cordwood when this was just a lumbering area. Um, it was ready to be shipped to Milwaukee and Chicago. Can you believe that's Highway 57? And Reynolds Store, which burned down. There you see Reynolds Store again and the Jacksonport Post Office and Lakeview Tavern, which also burned down. Um, Grandpa loved taking pictures, and every spring, until they built a berm, um, Hibbard Creek overflowed onto County Trunk A, and there's Grandma way back in there in the flood. In the winters, they didn't have snow plows, so that little intersection right in the middle of Jacksonport, this is what it looked like in the winter. When my great-grandpa Lincoln Erskine died, um, Grandpa went to Sturgeon Bay to get his brother, who came in on the train, and they got stuck. <laughs> Grandpa had to take a picture. And the other thing they had to do, um, the family had to go and um, dynamite a, a spot in the frozen ground in order to bury the casket in the family. They did it. It wasn't something back then that they could have someone do. This is the book that I wrote on Grandpa, uh, you, on his World War I photos. This is Robert Onan's painting of the Eureka House. The building had been a boarding house for travelers before it became the Jacksonport Post Office. And Robert Onan, who also was a Jacksonport artist, also painted this portrait of my grandmother, Gertrude Gertie Erskine. Aileen Scutt. Is anyone here who was related to Aileen Scutt? Oh, awesome! Would you like to say something about her? Um, I have this. You can even either read that. Come to this microphone up here, please. Would you do that? Oh, I'm so glad someone is here. And what relation are you? I am her daughter-in-law. And um, I didn't, I came into her life just after she closed her shop, which was 64 years ago. And she did work, uh, you can see it's the silver pieces over there on the left, and it's called repoussé. And she also did a lot of jewelry in Repoussé. And she works, it's, Repoussé is not something that where you can put something on top of something. It has to be pounded out and heated. And um, she, I remember she had a pitch block that she used to pound out this 
It's forming a design by raising and lowering the flat piece of silver. And um, it, she, it says, this gives a pleasing three-dimensional richness to her jewelry. And the only people that still practice it is like um, your flat silverware that maybe many of your parents had and valued. Um, they still do it in some of those houses, but otherwise it is an old art form. And then in her later years, she got into sculpture. And I, she, I still do have um, an obsidian head, which obsidian is a volcanic glass. So um, when you're working with it, it's very difficult because it may shatter, but she did a negroid head. And um, she has had a number of wards on some of her silver. She's uh, lived in Milwaukee, but spent her most of her summers in up here. So, Thank you. Yeah. And this is her workshop. I have a picture of her workshop. <laughs> and two more pieces of her jewelry. And now Noreen Golden. And who is here for Noreen? Maureen, where yes, are you? Oh, there you are. I'm sorry. Pretty much you have everything written there that I'm going to say. But okay. My then name is Maureen Howell, and I live in Jacksonport with my husband, Jonathan. My mother, Noreen Calkins Golden, loved Door County. Although my parents never lived here, they rented from Oscar Scott every summer since I was seven. My mother took up painting in her 40s while raising six children. She took lessons for years and eventually gave lessons to some of her sisters and nieces. She started her own art class called Ladies of the Easel. <laughs> they met every week for art, drinks, and dinner. My mother was so generous with her paintings. If you commented about a painting in her house that you liked, she would take it off the wall and give it to you. She was always doing paintings for others as gifts. She had given away so many that my brother-in-law, Gunter, who is here, who is also an artist, put together a book of as many paintings as we could track down. We brought the book here tonight. And I'm my, showing it. Oh, perfect. Yep, here it is. My mother touched so many people with her beauty as a person and as an artist. I'm proud to be her daughter and share some of her works with you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Can I interject that one of her paintings is in our theater book? Thank you. I'm going to show, I have 42 paintings. So I am only going to show the first five slowly. Then I'm going to go through because um, we really want to have time for the three living artists that we are presenting tonight. So. I will show the first one slowly, and I apologize. Just give me feedback if I'm going too fast um, after the first few. And Maureen, if you want to say something about one of them, please feel free to. Well, the first one was uh, my son, and uh, that's my son. And she did that from a picture we took when he was in Wales with his cousins. And the other one, the second one, that was one of her very first ones. That was when she first took it out. And then the, this is a copy of a famous painting. That is also a copy. I don't know if it's a famous painting, but it, it was not from life. Uh, is she painted that, on that a dresser? Is, she, that, that is a jewelry box. She oh. gave each of us a jewelry box that she painted a scene on. And that was the one she gave to me. And that is a, it's a toy chest that was in our house when we bought it. It was just a plain cedar chest. And um, I just painted it the solid color, and my mom did these beach scenes on it. And that's a picture of my husband, Jonathan, from a photo. Oh, when he was a baby. Oh, my mother oh, did that. looks just like you. <laughs> my mother did that and sent it to his mother, who lived in England. Oh. And that's our youngest son, Mark. That's a picture my mom did of, well, it, it probably was a copy. 
and that's a watercolor she did. She loved painting children. And she was getting macular degeneration by that time. And that's another one of children she loved doing once of children. <coughs> Jonathan was a sailor, so she did that especially for Jonathan. I think my sisters would know, is that a, something from a picture in the Caribbean? Could be, yeah, it could be. Uh, that is, uh, the family has a house in Wales, Jonathan's extended family, and that would be out the window in the house in Wales. And that's a picture my mom just did from life, that she did from life. From life, well, that, I don't know, we didn't have a horse, so I don't know. She was. <laughs> Another child one. That's Jonathan and our sunfish in Jacksonport. Jacksonport. Yep. This is a picture that was over my mother's bed. And every time we'd come to see her when she was not well, I remember personally saying, Mom, I love that picture. She said, well, you can have it when I die. <laughs> so evidently, my mother said that to every one of the six children. <laughs> because when she died, we all said, oh, I said, Mom said I could have that. <laughs> oh, no, Mom said I could have it. So we did oh, a little yeah. auction. Um, can everybody hear Maureen, yeah. or should I ask yeah. her to stand up? You can yeah. hear her. Thank you. That's our my grandson. Mm -hmm. Just yeah, not sure. If you stood up, we can see her better. Oh, uh, they'd like to see you, Maureen. Oh. Well, I don't know about this, but this was done for one of my children, but it wasn't actually one of my children. It was for their bedroom. And same with this. And this, my mother just loved the character on his face. I don't know if that my sisters might know. Is that from a a painting? I don't know. No, I don't. Yeah, I love the characters. Ron is in Paris. This is for, my mother did this for a friend of hers who moved to Hawaii. And that, that woman died and her son just came and brought it back to me. Oh. Uh -huh. Mary, you have that one, don't you? No. no. I got another bold poster one, but not that one. Yeah. This is not, also was one of her very first. And that, of course, was a little bit at the end of watercolor. That's a copy of a Steve Hanks. I'm not sure who has that one. That's in our house. That's a British picture. Okay, and that's it. Okay. Thank you so much. This made it so interesting. Who is here for Kathleen Kitt Butler Coolius? Anybody here? She's got a bunch of relatives in this room. <laughs> I'm here, but uh, other than saying she painted and drew, I can't add much. Uh, oh, okay. Her, her son has her paintings. Yes. Okay, and I will explain that then. Thank right. you. If there's anything you want to say as I show them, please do. Um, Jackson Port was home base for Kathleen, but she lived in various states. In high school, she majored in art. During the summer, she taught art at her father's boys' camp in Jackson Port. Um, Noreen earned her bachelor of science degree from Northwestern University with a major in creative design. During World War II, she became an occupational therapist. Art, however, was always her passion. In 1957, Noreen received a certificate in art education at State University of New York. Oh, thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I knew I'd get something. I love it when you remind me. Please do. Sorry. Oh, age is hard. <laughs> um, <coughs> In, I'll, I'll back up. In 1957, Noreen received a certificate in art education at State University of New York. Her paintings are in the Jacksonport home of her son, Sean Coolius, um, and in her home on Sean's property. The picture, the house picture there, was her home that Sean had moved to his property. Um, and it is just full of her paintings. Um, 
Her paintings are predominantly landscapes that capture her view of Door County. 23 of them are in this presentation, so I'll go a little bit slowly with the first ones, and then I'm going to speed up again in the interest of time. However, if there's any Butler family member who wants to say something about a painting or Kathleen, and you see something that sparks a memory, please get my attention. That house can still be viewed off County T, if some of you may know it. Mm -hmm. if, if you didn't hear, the house is on County T. Virginia, if you have any comments, please. Okay, I'm, I'm enjoying this. Okay. Um, as far as I know, this is the only self-portrait she did. Oh, how I remember those things from when I was a kid down at the beach, this especially. Excuse me? The fishing nets. The fish nets. Oh, was it fish nets mm -hmm. that were on the... The fish nets, yes. Oh, okay. They would put them on them there to dry and then they would repair them. <laughs> okay, and next is Joseph Cook. And Dan has something, yep talk about Joseph and may I stand up and is the yes microphone and good? you can even pick it up it's awkward if it's if you think it's not loud enough you know I thought it was time for a word from our sponsor <laughs> I was on the, I was on the phone this morning with Betty Crocker and she says to tell all of you nice people that the next time you're in the grocery store aisle that sells tuna helper be sure to pick up a box or two and make it at home and Betty says hello to all of you. You know, Phyllis, I don't know why I'm invited here tonight. I hardly know anything about Joe Cook. I wish I knew more. I did know him, which I'm very happy about. I met him when I first started my music business way back in 1981. And that first summer, I had an art gallery in my basement of the old schoolhouse up on the hill. The old and, and he had my grandfather's yeah. photos. Yes. Yeah, we had like hundreds of people yes. show up to see them yeah. on that opening day. Well, Joe Cook came to my gallery and asked if he could display his serographs, his silkscreen prints, and I said, oh, absolutely. So he brought some over to me to display, and they're absolutely beautiful, unlike the ones that you see in the back of the room for sale from Fred Erskine's uh, photographs. He did some very bright, brightly colored works of Door County wildflowers. For instance, <coughs> marsh marigolds, um, lady slippers, and they were not as large as those pieces back there. They were more like this, but extremely brightly colored. Joe and his wife, Ruth, lived up on Memorial Drive as you go north toward Egg Harbor. And their house, I think, was the first tiny house in Door County. It was so sweet. It was basically, I would say, less than <coughs> 700 square feet. It was two floors. You would walk in to the living room that then connected to a dinette. And then off of the dinette was the kitchen. You would go upstairs, and Joe had his office, and it was about the size of a closet. <laughs> Joe was, as far as his personality, he, he was very friendly. I noticed and observed how he would come to town hall meetings. He was trying to blend in with the farm community. It was funny. He would come in bib overalls, trying to look like a farmer, and he wasn't a farmer. <laughs> wasn't, he from, wasn't he from Chicago, where he did display work? He attended classes part-time at the Chicago Art Institute, oh. um, received his Bachelor of Arts degree from University of Arkansas Fayetteville, 
majored in art. So Joe, the Chicago boy, tried to fit into Jacksonport as a farm boy, and it didn't really work. I mean, it was kind of humorous. But Joe was a nice man. You always knew that Joe was in charge. I worked with him. He did this silkscreen sign that I brought with me. It was of my music business way back in 1981, 82. And so it's silkscreened on both sides. It's a little keyboard that I have at home that he designed and drew. My sister's stife teddy bear is holding the keyboard. And I named my business back then, Bertelsen Recordings, after my great-grandpa Olaf Bertelsen from Norway. So this is an authentic Joe Cook piece. I'd like a million dollars for it. <laughs> oh, and Phyllis is giving me that look like, Dan, you're too low. Oh, did I say one thing? I want two million. Two million. And now, if there's anyone who doesn't know about serographs, which I didn't, um, a serograph print is an original artwork created by applying ink through a silk screen to paper. Joe's wife, Ruth, was also extremely kind and nice. I think faith was a very important part of their life. I thoroughly went through the Lutheran Church Cemetery before this program, thinking that Joe and his wife were buried there, and they're not there. I, I'm wondering if they were Baptist, and if someone had the time to learn more about Joe Cook and his wife Ruth by going to the Laurie Reading Room at the library in Sturgeon Bay and going through old Door County advocates trying to learn about Joe through an obituary. Joe would have died first, and then his wife at some point sold the house, the tiny house on Memorial Drive. By the way, as you drive up there, it's on the right-hand side, um, a little bit north of the cemetery. You can't miss the house, it's the tiny house. So Ruth then moved from the house to an apartment in Sister Bay, I did not keep in touch with her. But they had two adult children who died. Ruth outlived them. I don't know why the children died. They were wonderful young people, not quite 30 years old. There was a daughter, Ellen, and a son, Bill. And I think it was Ruth who called me both times to tell me that they had died. But it's so long ago, I just don't really remember what had happened. They did not die together. They were separate illnesses. Well, that's Joe Cook. And, and I am going to just interject in this serograph. Um, you can see a little girl with a big white bonnet toward the back. Mm -hmm. That's my mother. Oh. <laughs> yep. Beautiful. And next is your mother. My mom. There's. There's no way I can sum up my mother's life in a couple of minutes, but I must say, the painting that I brought of mom's that describes a time of her life is from 1965, and it's over on the table. It's a painting of Christ, and it's a stunning portrait that is very simple. Would you pick it up, please? No. Yes. I <laughs> <laughs> can't make it. Here it is. But it's from about 1965. I grew up with my mom at our home in Wausau, and I'm of that baby boom generation that grew up with everything was out of a can. My mom did not enjoy cooking, and so our kitchen was combat ready. <laughs> we ate cream of chicken soup with everything. <laughs> and instead, we would walk home from grade school, my brother and sister and I, and our house smelled of turpentine because my mother painted in our little dining room in the kitchen, and so we didn't come home to freshly baked cookies. <laughs> we came home to freshly painted oil paintings, and most of them were portraits. My mother was self-taught. She went to college for one year uh, at St. Olaf College, and then 
taught herself as a young mom how to paint. She studied Renoir, somebody French, of course, because of our French background. And she started to do portraits. Then at some point, mom and dad got divorced in the 1960s. Mother went back to school to UW-Stevens Point, which was an hour's drive from our home in Wassa, mom commuted and got her teaching certificate in art, and she came, we moved to Door County in 1974 to the old schoolhouse. So I won't take up more time, but what I wanted to tell you, some of you remember my dear old family friend, Marianne Johnson, from her Scandinavian and Austrian sweater shop in Bailey's Harbor. She created the Bailey's Harbor Historical Society back in the 1980s, and she ran that by herself up until the time her husband died in 2007. Marianne is living, and I've over the years seen her often at her home in Chicago. The last time I was going to drive and see her was right before COVID, and COVID broke out, and I never did see her. In the meantime, Marianne has dementia, which she never wanted to happen. I remember she told me one time, I hope that I can always be myself, and it didn't turn out that way. Her son, who is a physician, took her from her home in Chicago over to Minneapolis, and she's in a nursing home there. But I thought I would mention that. She was a wonderful friend of my family's, and I'm so sad that um, I'll never really see her again and have the conversations that I once did um, also, Kay Kruger died, and I bet all of you know that. Kay Kruger, her funeral is this coming Friday at 11 a.m. at the Catholic Church here in town. She was one of the first people we met uh, when we first moved here in 74, and a very sweet lady. So I was happy to know her, and very sad that she's gone. So thank you all for listening. And if you have anything to say about the paintings, please add it. Well, it shows how some of those paintings are done by my mother and some by my sister. But it shows how, over time, my mother moved beyond portraits of children to surrealism mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to abstraction. Mm -hmm. and. My mother's faith was very important to her. The, the one thing mother learned from her family was think for yourself. And it followed not only in her faith and thinking for herself, but also in her occupation with art. Think for yourself. Don't be afraid of your own imagination. Okay, and there is Jane. Please. Wow, it's an honor to be here with, with all of you and to see this art that's right from these people who aren't here, who are, I'm just, I got goosebumps from listening to all of you who have spoke for your family, Marilyn. Mm. Well, Patricia. And Rosier Rondo, my mama. There was a never a dull woman at our home. <laughs> um, she did s study at Mount Mary College in Milwaukee, uh, but then she met my father. And and I don't know. I I have to speak. I don't want to because some things are hard. I want to talk about her, but it was who she was. Um, I want to give the whole picture of, in a way, of who she was. And as we know, as human beings, we, we do have dark sides and we do have other sides to us. And I don't want to sugarcoat her because she was not sugarcoated. She was real and she was... So she didn't finish college, she got pregnant and my dad married her. That was my sister, 11 months older than me. And so she raised, she had four children, didn't attend UW-Whitewater, majoring in speech and art education. 
until I was like, um, I think I was 20 years old when she did that. Um, and she did, we, we stayed at Spikehorn camps in the summer. My dad was an outdoorsman and a sailor, and um, we would stay out at Spikehorn by Cana Island. Yes. And he would come up on weekends, and my four siblings and I stayed in a pup tent right by the lake, and they had a little pop-up camp for with my brothers and my mom and dad. And we'd stay all summer, and dad would come up on the weekends. So um, that was really, I love being by the lake like that. And, and I'll start showing her pictures now, and yeah. you can keep talking. Okay. Um, oh, this was when Mom and, when they were married. She painted their little champagne glasses. And this was some of her first works before she was married of oils. And this was a uh, pastel of a woman that I think she had a picture of. And so this was a woodcut that she did. And, and then this, this was a glass that she found, broken glass from a Catholic church, and put the pieces together. I have that at home in Jacksonport now. It doesn't give the, uh, the beauty of it. You can't really see it. It was on a piece of wood, and she kind of glued those pieces. So not a glass you look through in the light. And then macrame, back in the 60s, that was a popular thing. Look at all these knots. I have this hanging. She, she just couldn't mute with her hands. And then cards she made. She used any media she could find. This was a card to her sister. She loved Halloween. <laughs> she loved Halloween. And um, any, she was like um, an artist creator, a creation herself, anything she could. Would, and she, what fascinated me when I was a child, she didn't have to look at a picture to draw something or color something. Was in, she just came out of her mind, her head. And that was another one of those. And um, we don't have a lot of her works. That stained glass piece was thrown over in the valley because my mom um, suffered from alcoholism. And so she... Um, was never happy with what she did, her paintings or something. And she, oh, this was a, a model when she was in, in uh, Whitewater at the school. She, she passed out that. But she would, um, and she was in theater. So she was a makeup artist. So she'd make up her face. She was a clown once, a witch at Halloween. And she'd make, make up her face. And she could be any cre a clown. A, a, She'd create these different characters in theater. And this was just a plate. That was when I was born. And she just, so many different medias she would use. Knitted ski sweaters, um, like those ones with the reindeer. She could knit those. And, and she had no formal training. This was until she went to Whitewater. And she didn't graduate, but she got a couple of years of, in Whitewater. And then through her, but cre her, her I, I know I'm going fast, but I have so much um, to say about her in a little bit. But um, so she, through her suffering with alcoholism and chemical dependency, she eventually sobered up after I was, grew up out of the house. And she became a, she went to school and got a little, a, two, a little degree in counseling family counseling. She treated the whole family and she worked in treatment centers. And when she was up speaking to people, she, because of her theater, she could just, just say, just, she could just be so dramatic and so much from her heart. And she, she helped many, many people sober up. Many have saved their lives by who she was and, oh my. Um, um, yeah, oh, like, I, you know, like with our parties, our growing up and having parties, she would take a watermelon, she'd create this, carve a watermelon like a bowl and make little melon bowls. Everything was just art. Everything she touched, she was art herself. And, 
And I think I don't that know. we probably need to move to the I'm, next one. Yeah. But this is just wonderful. It, this makes it so special to have Papi, people who know the artist and can talk about her, can make her come alive, make him and her come alive. Thank you. Thank you. For all you. This And Joe, I think you're going to come up to speak about Jean Wilden. No, um, I am. Oh, you are. Okay. Thank you, Loretta. You're welcome. Jean Wilden was originally from Chicago. Maybe she, come by oh, the I'm microphone sorry. Okay. to see if that'll help. Jean Wilden was originally from Chicago. Her father was an artist illustrator for the Encyclopedia Britannica. She also graduated and was an illustrator, her first job for fashion in a Chicago newspaper. She left Chicago, married her husband, moved to Bannockburn. In the late 80s, they purchased a house over on Lake Shore on our road and the lady she purchased it from was a first woman banker in the state of Wisconsin. And I can't remember her name. But Gina became, before she moved here, she had an accident painting a mural in her house. And she became disabled. They moved up here and they retired. And she started word working. She was very talented. She could do anything. So this enabled her to become involved in the art community. She was a past president of the Door County Art League for at least seven years and involved with them for at least 10, 15 years. She was an excellent person as a mentor to younger artists, pushing everybody. Um, and now I'm starting to show her. This was in the craft cottage, correct? Well, I think that was in um, the Mayfest parade. I'm pretty, I think, I wish I would have remembered the things that were said about it. It's so interesting. I mean, she painted all the way around and noticed the heart-shaped uh, toilet seat. <laughs> and I am sorry, I don't remember the story behind this. Does anyone know? Okay. And I do know the story behind this. Um, she painted this as a gift for um, Sue Jerash, Jerash um, and all on this it shows all of the things that Sue was good at. So it really is a testimony to the person that Sue um, is. This one's displayed over here. And Joe, do you want to say something about these? I think that this is you. Well, yes, Jean did those for Peter and I. We used to do uh, lobster boils on the beach every so often. <coughs> and I thought that was one of the greatest ones she'd ever done. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one was from when I had the gallery on um, this road with Lois Stewart, the Fieldstone Gallery. So those, that's how she pictured us. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and thank you so much for making the past artists come alive with all that you shared. Now we have three artists who are currently here and producing wonderful creative work. Loretta. Loretta's here. <laughs> I live in Iowa City some of the time and I live here some of the time. And when I come here, I like to paint. So I go out and we use different places in Door County. Jean also. When I first moved here, she mentored me quite a bit. Jean also, she only lived five houses away. So when I was here, every night after supper, we were over sucking down the line. <laughs> Jean was a great partier. <laughs> and um, I just can't say enough about being up here. When I'm here, I don't want to go home. She's so beautiful. And I have added something to what I wrote that Loretta has this tiny cottage with a beautiful deck overlooking Lake Michigan. And she paints out at a little table on the deck 
listening to the water rolling in. And in my spare time, I garden. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and takes care of her dogs. And my dogs, yes. And you've received many awards in Wisconsin and, and in I Iowa. Know. And I keep growing and I'm putting together a website, but there's just... Oh. Do you want to say anything about your paintings? I have 19 of them, so okay, I will... Go ahead. I okay, let me know if you want to say anything. The last two are hanging on the wall at Phyllis's house. Oh. <laughs> thank you so much, Loretta. Oh, thank you. Well, I am not an artist. <laughs> I am not an artist, and Phyllis talked me into coming here tonight. I, I, I'm an art historian, and I know a lot about art, but I am not an artist myself. Um, art historians are people who can't draw. <laughs> they don't know how. But you can enjoy it. And but I enjoy it, it and, I, and I appreciate it. And I, it was just wonderful to hear all these stories tonight. And the, the quality of the art in Jacksonport is just amazing over the years. I, I was really impressed with it. But I have written a few books. And um, that's what got me here from Phyllis. Phyllis was organizing this. My latest book, I've written uh, five books, but the, my latest book is The Forest, and it delves into the specifics of a 15-acre forest my husband Tom, who's sitting over there, and I own on our side of the peninsula, this side of the peninsula. This is, uh, and it's a little north of Cape Point and White Fish Dunes Park. Although small, our, it's 15 acres, our forest is a microcosm of all Door County forests. It has 100-year-old towering pines, hemlocks, sugar maples, white birch, cedars, and balsam trees that we have on this side of the peninsula and all over the peninsula. Um, wildlife species that we have in the forest are fishers, owls, deer, woodchucks, wild turkeys, porcupines. These are all in the book. And a great variety of songbirds and small mammals, which are frequent mem um, visitors to our forest. The forest is covered with wildflowers, mosses, ferns, mushrooms, lichen, and fungi. Open areas of the forest are home to wild raspberries and thimbleberry bushes. Our forest has remnants of the Niagara Escarpment, Dolanite bedmark, Bedrock, and Rolling Ridges. And an early 20th century logging road runs through our property, which is fun. For more than 20 years, Tom and I have worked to clean up our woods when we first bought the lots. Everything was just tangled. You couldn't see through it at all. And we just cut down the tilters and leaners and started out and, you know, and it, now it's, it's very, it's very, we have paths through the woods. It's very nice. Um, <clears throat> it took me a year um, to research and photograph and write the book. In the process, I learned to love our forest so much more. I really had to discover, I had to discover all the tree species and I have to learn about them. And everything is in, the, everything that I've talked about is photographed by me and that's in the book. And that's how I, I'm, <laughs> she thinks I'm an artist. <laughs> because I photograph some pictures. Okay, I consider my book to be a guide to the woods of Door County, part souvenir, part field guide, and part art photo book. So, that, so that's where we get into that. I have a couple of tidbits that I learned. I have a couple of tidbits that I learned in the process of writing this book that I thought you might be interested in. Do you know that trees are living beings? Do you consider them that? Okay, good. Do you know that you share a quarter of your genes with trees? That's amazing to me. I was stunned by that. Do you know that a tree's root system is 100 times larger than all the leaves on the tree? Wow. So that 100 times larger underground than what you see. And you see the big maples and all the big, um, 
bigger. Do you know that our ancient, uh, that our beautiful ancient beech tree species are in danger? Everybody's shaking their head. That's so sad. Um, do you know how to estimate the age of trees in your backyard, or do you have any idea how to estimate the age of your trees? The forest book that I wrote tells you exactly how to do it. Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> One final thought. Do you know without humans, trees would manage just fine? <laughs> without trees, people would perish. We'd be gone. So, so I have my books over there. Trees are 100, some even 200 years on your property. The root structure below them, it can be thousands of years old. So when a tree is cut or die or falls, uh, the root structure traditionally will push up another tree, right at that root structure. So you can really say that the trees you're looking at, their root structure is thousands of years old and continues to exist. Well, it is my pleasure to introduce Wentz Martinez, an internationally known weaver from Oaxaca, Mexico. His gallery is on Highway 57, just south of Jackson Port, across from Mr. G's. And they also, he and Sandra also have one on Canyon Road in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I would say if you've never been to Wentz's gallery, it's time to go. <laughs> It's unbelievable that we have artists of their stature here in Jacksonport. Sandra and Wentz have numerous awards to their credit. They were featured in the American Craft Magazine the fall of 2021. And I'm going to put it over there so you can look a little bit to see some of their work. And the work is all along there. Two of the rugs are brand new. Some of the pieces in the middle are some of their early pieces from when they came to Jacksonport. And the one on the far side is of the leopard is, was done by Wentz's father. Um, <coughs> Wentz and Sandra have nu numerous awards to their credit. They were feet, oh, I just said that, sorry. Dear. <laughs> okay, they're exhibited in, They've been exhibited in five consecutive Smithsonian craft shows. They received the 19, or 2016 Silver Award for overall excellence in, and the 2017 Exhibitor's Choice Award in, in 19, or 2017. They were finalists for the American Craft Council. In 2018, they were awarded a United States Artist Fellowship. Their work is in the permanent collections of the National Museum of Mexican Art in Chicago, the Smithsonian National Museum of American Indian Art in Washington, D.C., and the Museum of Wisconsin Art, West Bend, Wisconsin. Wentz will now tell you a little bit of his history, where he was raised, how he got into weaving, and how he came to Jacksonport. Wentz. Thank you for having me. It's a huge honor to be here, even though I have no roots in Jacksonport. <laughs> <clears throat> but thank you anyway. Um, I'm from Oaxaca, Mexico from a little village called Teotitlan del Valle, known for its weavings. And I, I started out very early in my early age um, as a kid helping out my parents. I was a shepherd growing up. At age nine, I started weaving, helping my parents you know, support the family. At age 14, I got a scholarship to go um, study a different technique of weaving in Mexico City. And from that on, really opened my eye to see uh, weaving as art and not just a craft. And then um, in 1987, I wove one of Sandra's designs before we met. After I finished that piece, uh, we shipped it back to um, 
Wisconsin, uh, Chicago, she was living back then. And then when she saw my work, she fell in love with the, you know, the piece that I did for her. And then like six months later, she came down and uh, with her friends who actually introduced us um, to meet me and to collaborate with other pieces that she had designed. And so 88 was the year that I came first in Chicago. We did some events in different galleries in Chicago. Uh, I did a demonstra demonstration at the Field Museum in Chicago, um, at the Mexican Fine Arts Center in Chicago. And after we did some events in 1988, we came here in Door County to visit um, her friends, because they were living here. And right away, I fell in love with Door County. <laughs> and so, you know, um, we started, I started coming seasonally, summers. Um, I would bring some of my artwork to show in different galleries. And in 1992, I believe that that's the first year I started showing my work with Lois uh, at the Fieldstone Gallery where Lois stored and Jolene Wellen was running. In 1994, we opened the gallery in the chicken coop by the Fieldstone Gallery. <laughs> and so we were there for six years. In 2000, in the year 2000, we bought the property here in uh, southern Jacksonport. That's when we moved to my new location. So somehow, from the beginning, uh, when we started coming here, we kind of gravitated to live on this side of the peninsula. At, in the, the ni early 90s, we rented a place like Grandma Cottages next to the rivers. We, we rented there for one season. And after that, because I was coming just seasonally. Um, but really, Jacksonport has been like home to me since then. Uh, some, of the, some of the ways we work you can see here one I'll of the go pieces. Back here. Yes. Um, there. Oh, this is the piece that is the National Museum of Mexican Art. This is the kind of traditional work that the weavers do in my hometown. Usually, they would pick one figure and blow it up. That wasn't really my interest of doing that when I was, you know, weaving my work. My interest was like if I ever do something traditional, I would do the whole scene. So this is like a six eight feet wide by six feet tall. It took me about nine months of full time weaving to do that piece. And the dyes in it are all natural from plants. This is the piece that it's at the um, Smithsonian Institute in the permanent collection. You know, um, when we did the uh, Smithsonian craft shows, we would go to this museum and we'd ask for permission to go in the archives. And then we found some of the weavings that was made in my village back in the 1920s. Oh. But we had no idea who wove them and who donated them. Nothing writing about them. No writing. No. Who knows quite where they came from, you know. But Sandra made a comment. She said, wouldn't it be nice if you, someday you have one of your weavings back here, you know, in the permanent collection? And I said, yeah. And then like within two years, we got a call from them and said they were interested in seeing some of my work. So we sent them some photos and they picked two. This is the other piece that they have, they have in the permanent collection. What an honor. So the way we work, like Sandra would work on a batch of her designs, drawings, paintings. After she's done with them, we'll go through them and we'll choose which ones would look good in weaving. So we would pick some and then I will go on and weave them. If you guys have any questions. This is the newest piece I did this, this past winter. And so this is my design. We have two lines of designs in my studio. I do the geometric patterns and the figures are her designs. This is an old piece that I, before I met Sandra, I worked with several painters in Mexico. This is from a painter, originally from California, who moved to Mexico City, uh, that I wove that in the 70s. This is one of the new pieces. I have one of them similar, with a different color on the table. And that's all that I have. Um, are, are you dyeing your own wool? I do my own dyeing. I use all hand-spun wool 
except that I don't spend the wall myself, myself, but I take it from there and clean it and dye it and everything else. And, and aren't some of your designs from your ancestors, designs that have come through the ages? Not necessarily. Most of my designs are contemporary, nothing to do with uh, traditional. Okay. Uh, some of them might have a little bit of it, but not necessarily taken from, you know, t traditional designs. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Did you have a question? I would just like to say there is a very large woven rug right now, unless you sold it. No. At the studio, how large is it? It's nine by twelve feet. Oh. Wow. So run on over. <laughs> And I would like to thank Phyllis for her vision. It was her vision to present this program um, on Jacksonport Artists, past and present. And when she first mentioned it to me before COVID hit, and I really hadn't caught her vision yet. I didn't know what we were doing. So we went to um, Kathleen Butler Coolius's home first, and I just took pictures of every painting that was there and she said oh you really went crazy taking pictures i didn't know what i was doing it for you <laughs> and here it is um so i just want to thank everybody who helped on the committee joe and um oh, lynn, lynn. <laughs> names and loretta so just and phyllis thank you that we put this together i really hope you enjoyed it a uh, couple more slides. Oh, I want to say something about Phyllis. She has translated and edited many plays. In Door County, she's written books about Jacksonport history, which are for sale here. And she's written about her friendships with writers abroad. She is involved with Rogue and Isadora Theaters and a playwrights group. She now writes original plays. She edited the edited the anthology of microtheater by Wisconsin and Spanish authors. Um, and it's being launched this evening. She just picked up the books today. I mean, they are hot off the press. <laughs> so this is the book, Microtheater, a Door County debut of short plays from Wisconsin and, Pain, and Spain. And I have my new book, The Heinz Crick Story, for sale here. Um, and I will be doing a presentation for the Jacksonport Women's Group coming up October 3rd. And here I've listed the items for sale. I will keep this up. And I want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you for coming tonight. I know everybody has busy lives, and yet you came, and we really appreciate it. All right. I certainly became interested in artists in Jacksonport quite a while ago when I wrote the book about Lakeshore Road, and we have copies here. I interviewed Loretta. I interviewed Jean Wilden, and I have them in the book and I have other items in there. So those of you who are interested in art might want to see that particular book from the Jacksonport series. And of course, the excitement tonight is that we're launching this.